Hello, everybody. My name is Amartya Lahiri. I'm a professor at the uh, University of British Columbia, the Vancouver School of Economics. And this is another episode of the series of conversations that we're having on Ideas for India. Our guest today is Professor Viral Acharya from the NYU Stern School of Business. Professor Acharya is the uh, CV star professor of economics over there. And as most of you would know, he also spent two and a half years in India as deputy governor of the, of the Reserve Bank of India. At some level, he needs no introduction, but it suffices to say that he has a breathtaking array of you know, academic issues that he has worked on, but combines that with hands-on uh, policy insights from uh, his time spent in, at the Central Bank in India. And so we're very, very pleased to have you here, Viral. I'll start with what is probably the uh, one of the bigger issues that the world has faced in the last uh, couple of years due to the, uh, the pandemic and the policy responses uh, to it. So clearly there's been this uh, mix of fiscal policy responses and monetary policy responses. Fiscal policy space has been a bit more limited in emerging economies. They seem to have relied a bit more on monetary policy as being the primary instrument to deal with COVID disruptions. But monetary policy in general has done a lot of heavy lifting, even in uh, the developed countries. Now, most of this seems to have taken the form of huge amounts of liquidity injection since March of 2020. I mean, that seems to have been the big thing that's uh, that's happened. So I just want to start with your take on this basic approach of, of injecting liquidity during moments of stress like COVID. Was the, the strategy appropriate? Was the quantum appropriate? And maybe you can start by discussing your impression of the US and, and, and the developed countries, and then if you want to expand that towards emerging economies. Yeah. No, thank you, Amartya, for uh, inviting me to have this conversation. I think it's fair to say that at least among the present-day central banking uh, world, it's almost become an article of faith that once you have large shocks, uh, the central banks should use their balance sheets in order to support the economy. Historically, central banks had gotten increasingly used to being lenders of last resort to banks. Uh, something where they gradually started eroding the principles of sort of the way Badgett had thought about lender of last resort, which is that you lend, but you lend at a penalty rate. You only lend against high quality collateral. And, you know, gradually over two to three decades leading up to the global financial crisis, the notion of too big to fail started taking hold, which is that, oh, the regulators are not going to allow large entities to fail. They are too systemic, too interconnected. And, and, you know, there's always some political aspects to bank bailouts. And so all that combined together, that had become the primary way that central banks were supporting the economy in times of stress. Then we entered this era in which central banks started using heavy interest rate cuts, even when asset markets started correcting. I would say Maybe the Greenspan era of interest rate cuts had this flavor, which is that if stock markets were tumbling or showing signs of boom and bust cycles, he said, we can't time the cycle at the peak. So we have to focus on mop up, but then you have to support the economy when the cycle turns. And along this line of thinking, what has happened post global financial crisis is that now there's a notion of markets being too systemic to fail. That we can't have a corporate bond market that freezes up. We can't have interbank markets that freeze up. We can't have ETFs where too many redemptions are taking place. We can't have money market funds being run upon. And so using the balance sheet, central banks are now beginning to extend guarantees or purchase assets in a manner that's, I think, effectively backstopping the markets at large. Now, of course, what I'm trying to get at is that this lever through which they are trying to come out of these shocks is getting larger and larger. Central bank balance sheet is a very powerful tool. It's ultimately backed by tax collections in some way because an undercapitalized central bank presumably will get capital from the fiscal authorities at some point. I think the question is, what are its implications? And I can see why it's become an article of faith. I can see the virtues of quickly backstopping everything when there is uncertainty, there's panic, uh, there's loss of confidence in the markets, and you can get sort of quick rebound. And I think they would say that 
how short the COVID recession has been is a sign of success of these policies. But what next? They do not tell us when they are going to exit from these policies, when they embark on these policies. In fact, other than a few countries, we still don't know what the exit path is. I would say we know now in case of Federal Reserve that there is an exit path. But for a large number of other advanced economies and emerging markets, there is no glide path. There is no forward guidance as to when the exit is. The forward guidance typically is that we will be here until it is necessary, so to speak. But what is quote-unquote necessary? What does that map into macroeconomic outcomes, etc., is never exactly specified. And I think this is where the real danger lies, which is that uh, when these policies of backstopping become in the perceptions of markets, individuals, investors, banks, other financial institutions, to be fairly long-winded with sort of no clear exit clause, essentially you get tremendous mispricing of risk. It starts out as an intended mispricing of risk. Then after a while, no one's talking about it. So perhaps it enters into some kind of beliefs or expectations of how the future is going to be. There's probably some complex behavioral and incentive-based theories interacting in how it all shapes up. I think the real danger, as I see it, is that as the lever of public support through central bank is getting larger and larger, so are the distortions. And I think one example of that is that in spite of tons of liquidity that got injected in the developed economies. Even liquidity problems in the markets have not been that uncommon. So in a recent paper with Raghuram Rajan, uh, we are trying to theoretically understand why is it that even when you have three, four trillion dollars of reserves outstanding, small shocks like extra tax collections, a Japanese holiday, so Japanese banks are not in the markets, some broker dealers are experiencing troubles. Why do small shocks like this lead to liquidity freezes of the type we saw with the repo market spike in September 19? And why was there such a huge dash for cash in March of 2020? A great pandemic is a large shock, but the dash for cash seemed sort of beyond anyone's stress expectations. And it seems that the system is developing liquidity dependence. They get used to a certain level of liquidity being around that liquidity then gets promised around as like contingent claims or implicitly the expectation that, oh, it's always going to be around. So let's finance yourself with short-term debt, claims to immediacy. Uh, let's take risky and illiquid assets because there's so much liquidity in the system. And then you get the sort of the fallacy of composition and pecuniary externalities, uh, et cetera, coming into play. And it seems that when you inject more liquidity, the demand for liquidity when the next shock arises far surpasses that supply of liquidity. And so it seems that this is just ratcheting up into a bigger and bigger central bank balance sheet expectation, a bigger and bigger lever. So with every shock, we are getting to employ bigger and bigger forbearance tools or backstop tools. I think this deserves some thought because it requires some introspection on part of the central banks because I think... It would be better if these policies were stopgap measures rather than five, 10 year support measures. Because over five or 10 years, there are other shocks. You genuinely alter perceptions of risk and the pricing of risk in markets. You can affect credit and capital allocation and lead to inefficiencies in its allocation because you are not allowing risks to be priced properly. Just as a quick clarification on this line of thought, the two ways of viewing uh, liquidity injection, one is that it's a high-frequency intervention to deal with high-frequency imbalances between demand and supply. And if I'm reading what you're saying right, is that it's sort of become converted into some low-frequency injection of liquidity that's just yeah. hanging there. So there's a liquidity overhang. And that is the primary distortion which is creating other... Is that the right way to think of this? Or, uh... Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, which is that it was meant to deal with sort of interbank market failures. You could almost argue that that is why central banks were set up to ensure that reserves are being pushed around in the system in the efficient way in the commercial banking system. But the scope of central bank intervention is now at a much higher scale. And as you said, at a very different frequency, these balance sheet normalizations are not even planned for two to five years after they are undertaken. 
and then sometimes they take off sometimes they are not allowed to happen because of the market reaction given this liquidity dependence and sometimes they take equally as long to normalize as well and so just to give you one example of a very massive distortion that can happen let me pose a question is it a coincidence that advanced economy and emerging market debt to gdps have either reached world war 2 levels or surpassed them and all of this has happened substantially at a time when central banks have been buying a ton of government debt of the markets uh, through their quantitative easing and other normalization policies if yes is the system being set up to have debt levels that are unsustainable if there were to be further shocks covid is not going to be the last shock that the global economy has second is this levels of public debt especially in case of emerging markets going to lead to crowding out of the private sector is it going to lead to inflationary pressures on central banks because there will be fiscal dominance of their interest rate and monetary policies is that going to mean that you get a wave of emerging market sovereign problems in the next decade if growth doesn't live up to expectations i think these are exactly the way you put it these have become very low frequency cycles the way i was explaining it to someone is that maybe after omicron uh, subsides perhaps covid policy phase will be over but will be left with what are now the post policy distortion because those are going to be out there for 5 to 10 years with us and we have to wrestle with them we have to think through how they are playing out and it's not complex because now we are not just intervening in banks we are intervening across board in market in some sense there is a parallel narrative on uh, the state of or an overview of, of the global economy which is one this chronically low interest rates which uh, we can call it a saving glut so there's that and then there is this overall productivity uh, has been sort of productivity growth has been fairly tepid for almost uh, a decade and a half if not longer now is that something that has also contributed to this because you talked about the public debt you know pick up there is this view that since rates are so low we shouldn't be pretty much everywhere growth rates have been greater than the interest rate so is this something to really worry about or are these worries sort of overstated in this current world or do should we say that you know, these kinds of low interest rates cannot persist if the public debt keeps growing the way it is so it will unwind where do you come down on this i think i, w- I would make three quick points in response amatha first is that i think in getting at this question one has to really think differently between advanced economies and emerging markets advanced economies have hard currencies in which they borrow there is the savings glut from central banks and investors in rest of the world that seems to chase these hard currencies and the governments that borrow in hard currencies so they enjoy some sort of safety premium and that allows them actually to more easily meet this condition that the cost of borrowing is lower than your uh, expected growth rates in case of emerging markets there may be Uh, as you know marcus brunemeyer of princeton says domestic safety premium but there is also a global safety premium that they can access to the extent capital controls allow but regardless of that emerging markets can experience large shocks and the domestic safety premium can become squeezed it can look very small compared to the global safety premium and when that happens the way marcus brunemeyer explains is that you basically get essentially the bubble bursting for the emerging market uh, debt so i would say that one important point to keep in mind second even for developed countries i think people are finding that fiscal multipliers are not that large you know there's a whole debate going on in macro some people argue that fiscal multipliers are extremely low job market candidates this year are estimating what the fiscal multipliers look like once you account for the fact that there's a counterfactual crowding out of the private sector when these fiscal borrowings take place so that brings down the multipliers further and i would say can we really just take it for granted that developed economy sovereigns won't have problems we've had greece in the last 10 years we've had italy i think by all metrics almost all advanced economies look more vulnerable now than they used to be so i think that gives me some pause as well which is at some point does reinhard rogo of kind of high debt to gdp level maybe it's at a higher level than the average 95 or 97% that they estimate but where is that tipping point we don't know 
and we are in a world of unknown because we haven't seen these kinds of death we are going right. past world war 2 now and, and third whatever it is it raises the prospect of fiscal dominance even in advanced economies is it really going to be the case that if the growth doesn't live up to expectations and they have 150% plus debt to gdp that there won't be a temptation to use inflation to reduce the real values of this debt uh will there not be a temptation to repress the financial sector to find ways to get them to buy more of the government debt will there not be a temptation to allow these things to continue on for as long as one can and where i'm getting at is that is it the case that low g the low growth is partly an outcome of these policies in the first place because rather than using structural reforms to make the private sector more profitable you keep using the fiscal toolkit where perhaps your multipliers are questionable in the first place another possibility is that maybe you use your banking sector and show forbearance towards it after global financial crisis or after a sovereign debt crisis but maybe they just go and do evergreening as we witnessed in japan in 90s europe in the last decade india and china in the last decade and then that zombie lending means that even though you are using a part of the quasi fiscal policy via the banking sector it's still resulting in a low g because you are actually throwing good money after the bad so my sense is that we should not take it as given that this secular stagnation is something that's orthogonal to the policies being pursued backstop policies when pursued at low frequency in large scale have great potential for credit and capital misallocation either to government or within the private sector and i wonder if the low growth rates we are seeing is because we are not allowing capital to be allocated efficiently we are becoming heavy central planners so to speak in one way or the other yeah yeah so i'll come back to a few of the themes you raised which i found quite uh, interesting but given this covid particular episode that we've had these extended injections of liquidity and low rates that have persisted one clearly worries about the zombie lending issue that you raised just these last 2 years could have created a lot of firms perpetuated a lot of firms which might otherwise just have disappeared might have artificially kept bank balance sheets uh, looking okay simply because uh, uh, they kept rolling stuff over um and this likely with banking systems that are less stable or less robust which tends to be in emerging economies So I just want to ask you how worried are you about the fact that we are about to head into some sort of a financial tightening cycle at, at least in developed countries there's more and more talk of normalization once that starts happening over the next two quarters or three quarters over the next year along with the pre-existing monetary expansion that sitting around on all these emerging economies you know the bank balance sheets are emerging economies heading towards some sort of a perfect storm that they're barely getting out of this and we are looking at a potential tightening cycle along with a potential overhang of poor quality assets and bank balance sheets is it something that one should worry about in a major way right right uh, yeah i think we should and i've been looking very closely at various metrics of emerging markets fiscal growth related inflation related banking sector related and trying to make sense of where they look like in terms of preparedness relative to past tightenings such as the around the taper tantrum when the tightening got delayed but at least it was a potential tightening shock and then in 2018 17 18 when the tightening actually uh, happened in in reality and uh, what i'm finding is that they seem to have learned the lessons on the external sector front perhaps which is that they seem to be better prepared in terms of their reserves to short term external debt ratios and so on some countries look better prepared in that they have cleaned up their banking sectors but they are still at reasonably higher levels of npas than what one might think is comfortable but where they look the most vulnerable is actually the fiscal because most emerging markets have even pre covid expanded fiscally quite a bit over the last decade so i think that to me uh, even leaving aside issue of whether credit and capital mis- allocation has been efficient during covid we have a pre covid initial condition of high levels of government debt 
which got only further built upon both in terms of absolute levels of debt and debt to GDP because the GDP didn't grow as much. And so both vulnerabilities have risen. Coming to zombie lending, etc., in a way, it was the intended policy during COVID. And I think during COVID, maybe one has to view it slightly differently because the Japanese and the European style zombie lending I was talking about or Chinese and Indian evergreening of the last decade. Uh, that was in an era when healthier firms could have actually deployed the capital to support economic activity. There were other options of creating jobs, etc. In case of COVID, one could argue that at least the initial shock was so large that it wasn't that there was going to be entry of new firms or that healthier firms would have replaced the jobs at the firms that got affected. So again, my sense is as a short-term backstop measure, it was absolutely the right thing to give debt moratoria, give forbearance to banks, uh, perhaps ease liquidity specifically in individual nooks and corners of the society. Uh, the question is when the growth rebounds, of course, healthier firms and more productive firms can deploy capital more uh, than the less healthy or the very distressed firms. And I think it is now that the issues of zombie lending, capital misallocation will now come to the fore. Uh, and exactly as you said, uh, as the rates are tightening, only then we are going to find out who has taken on too much short-term debt, which firms have used cheap debt to build cash buffers and improve their resilience, rather than use cheap debt to actually misallocate capital and increase leverage. Because in an interest rate tightening shock, the investors will now start scrutinizing balance sheets of firms much more, and they will start discriminating by credit quality very, very quickly. I think this is going to happen in the United States, where there has been a ton of borrowing, both in the junk bond space, as well as I would say in the firms which are very close to the triple B rating, which is sort of the investment grade cutoff. I like to think of them as prospective fallen angels. In some research I'm doing recently, there is evidence that these firms seem to have lenient ratings. They seem to enjoy sort of credit subsidies because insurance firms who used to invest in treasuries don't have enough supply of treasuries because of quantitative easing. So they are searching for yield. So all this is going to play out. And this is exactly the kind of capital market distortion and a leverage boom and bust cycle that the policy could have potentially induced. But just coming back to emerging markets, I tend to agree with you that the concern is that they haven't recovered in growth as much as, say, United States has, perhaps because of the differences in the fiscal policy and the capacity. And they are experiencing a global tightening cycle before they have actually come back to pre-pandemic growth levels. Uh, some have, some have not. I think it's going to be a very interesting phase. Some countries do look more vulnerable than others. And I think with high levels of debt to GDP that we have right now, I don't see how there won't be some turbulence for emerging markets in the coming year. So, uh, you know, it's interesting what, you know, the connection to junk bond market. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not even sure that there's a clear separation there between emerging economy, because at least my recollection of these patterns of correlations of bond returns or bond prices is junk bonds and emerging market sovereign bonds are very highly correlated. So, I mean, if, yeah. if in as much as there is this introspection that goes on in advanced economy markets on who's been doing due diligence, who's just been leveraging up and so on, in as much as that shows up on the junk bond discounts, it's yeah. going to potentially, uh, just directly from there, start spilling over into uh, emerging market cost of funds because they tend to get put together in the same risk category yes, as yes. The, uh, the, the large part. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, my experience when I was at the central bank was that uh, there are also idiosyncratic risk spillovers within the EM space. So you could have one or two countries getting impacted and causing losses on emerging market mutual fund or asset managers. And then they have a tendency to retrench from risk across board because they are hitting their risk limits. And uh, so I think even if you may not be, say, in the bottom third of the pack in the emerging markets, if you are not in the very top pack, uh, even the middle of the pack has to worry about this sort of contagion and spillover effects. 
I think one second point I would stress there is also that, and I think this is maybe less appreciated, maybe because it's more controversial, is that because the real rates have been so low post-pandemic because of the rate cuts and the glut of liquidity that central banks have pumped in, a lot of dollar froth has actually gone into equities, in my view. And the equity market valuations, the crypto valuations, the housing valuations, they, through the wealth channel, have actually kick-started some of the consumption engine in emerging markets, especially among the very wealthy. Uh, if you look at India's consumption over the last year, for example, it seems that the consumption engine has been a bit lopsided, where the wealthy are spending a lot more uh, imports of luxury cars are picking up, whereas consumption at the bottom of the pyramid has not actually picked up that much. And I think one reason is because the bottom of the pyramid is not in the markets and they don't enjoy the wealth shock that these low interest rates and easy dollar and domestic liquidity policies are producing. What am I trying to get at? I'm trying to get at that this time around, when the Fed cycle turns, and you know we also have a commodity cycle that seems to be coinciding with that, yeah. that this joint occurrence can lead to a manifestation of capital outflows in the sense of hot money flowing out, not just from debt markets, but also from equity markets. This is a bit unlike the taper. In taper, the equity markets were reasonably resilient even though corrections happened, but in terms of outflows, it was really the debt markets that were getting punished. My sense is that the post-COVID negative real rates, even in emerging markets, have implied that everyone was seeking equities and that it may be a mistake to think of FPI flows in equities as permanent ca capital injections into the economy. And you had mentioned earlier that we might touch upon capital controls, I'm not proposing capital controls on equities or something like that. I'm just saying that maybe stress scenarios that central banks are envisaging from the dollar tightening and U.S. Fed uh, interest rate hikes, maybe that should allow for actually substantial outflows of FPI equity, unlike what we have witnessed in the past, because a ton of money flew in. And the only explanation I have for that is that there was just a ton of dollar liquidity earning nothing in the U.S. fixed income markets. So you touched upon a couple of things I want to talk about, get a bit deeper into. So one is this issue of what lessons, I mean, this international financial architecture has been going through a little bit of an introspection because you know, after the financial crisis of 2008 and the taper tantrum, there have been increasing discussions of, A, should we allow this kind of unfettered movement or some amount of these older ideas of throwing sands in the wheel have come back again. And a lot of countries, a lot of, you know, policymakers and academics, there's been this increasing discussion of, in some sense, older themes somehow never go out of fashion. They tend to come back in cycles. So this is, again, being discussed. And the IMF is also on board about trying to say that maybe just this complete free-flowing of uh, capital may not be the optimal way to go. Some amount of controls, whether we call that macro potential, whether we call that something else, but maybe we should revisit that issue. So I, I want to get your take on that. And the second is, along with this, the taper tantrum, one of the other things that had come up was, should there be some policy coordination between developed economies and emerging economies to minimize the disruption, potential disruption, because the cycles are completely uncoordinated, uh, monetary policy cycles can create or exacerbate issues. Are we still in that kind of world? Is that kind of issue still alive? And, and where do you stand on that? Is there some role for international monetary policy coordination? Or this is something that uh, is just not feasible or not really needed, given that most central banks in emerging economies have built up a ton of foreign exchange reserves now, so maybe they've endogenously created enough of a ammunition you know, depot that it has obviated the need for this kind of coordination. So capital controls and international policy coordination, where do you stand on these two things? Yeah, my sense is the capital controls have to be really calibrated to the macroeconomic stability of the country. As I was mentioning earlier, Emerging markets tend to be hit by shocks very often 
they could be commodity price shocks the domestic shocks you know, political shocks i think are far more frequent in emerging markets than elsewhere and so in a time when your macroeconomic stability is not too high inflation levels are high your risk premiums are high emerging markets are a wonderful haven for carry traders so you get the easy monetary cycle in the us us assets are not yielding much especially if that's also coincident with quantitative easing where even the long end of the curve in the us is getting pulled down through purchases of longer term treasuries then this money has to seek out higher yields elsewhere and what better than an emerging market that has some stability but not enough of it so that there is sort of nice risk there's a nice risk premium on top of that and in benign low vol low volatility conditions it looks like you are earning 4 5% extra return on these investments and then of course the moment the cycle turns the carry traders will start retrenching that's the essence of carry trade to pocket the carry and exit before the currency depreciation happens so my sense is to the extent emerging markets are not able to reach high levels of macroeconomic stability like say chile has for example i don't think they can really afford to do away with capital control chile has done away with capital controls but i think that's because they've reached a certain level of macroeconomic stability they are very integrated in the global trade front they generate surpluses by and large rather than generating current account deficits they have reasonably developed capital markets over time chile has built fair deal of credibility on inflation front from its central bank i would say most of the emerging markets are works in progress so to speak they haven't yet reached that final point of macroeconomic stability that's one coming to the issue of international coordination my sense is they are trying to do it better over time i think taper tantrum was a surprise to many emerging markets but now through fora such as the bank for international settlements and perhaps through private communications uh, i believe central bankers are more in sync with each other as to what their thinking is on the global economy and its trajectory Uh, of course uh, the federal reserve has taken extraordinary steps in my view during the post pandemic policy response for these other countries besides providing the central bank swap lines uh, it has also provided a standing repo facility so that rather than having to dump the treasuries to generate the dollar reserves these emerging market central banks many of them uh, can simply pledge their treasuries to the fed and get dollars in exchange so they don't have to go to the market to do this that may also help as a stabilizing factor but where i come down on all of this in the end both on capital controls as well as the international coordination is that one no matter what your capital controls are because unless they are so stringent that you have given up on the financing that emerging markets need from outside to grow and that the coordination that fed is acting in the greater interest of the global economy rather than its national interests both of which i think are unrealistic and so what is an option on the table one that i've been pushing a lot more through sort of policy talks rather than academic work is that maybe emerging markets really need to think hard about fdi they need to think about foreign direct investments as i was just explaining in my view equities can also be fairly fickle fdi flows what you need is foreign direct investment those are large stakes they are extremely illiquid no one can sell 25 or 40% of their holdings of a company you know like unwinding a carry trade that's going to be very very hard and on this front some countries have done quite well like of course china is a major recipient of a global fdi India has done extremely well on this front in my view over the past 5 to 10 years and it's a good example of how something that looks a bit orthogonal such as policy to promote entrepreneurship in the economy can actually have far more stable outcomes for the external sector than simply focusing it very narrowly in the sense of capital controls because what you want to do is generate more stable long term inflows and reduce the reliance on fickle flows as a way of financing your current account deficits etc and i think you know india of course through a series of reforms since early 90s 
First, we went through an entrepreneurship wave where we became the tech services hub for the rest of the world. A lot of FDI, et cetera, came in through that. Now the industry seems to have matured. Many of them then started developing new products and their own services rather than just sort of maintaining softwares and so on. In the second wave, they were still providing services to foreign companies. But now in the third wave, we have the sharing economy style uh, tech services like EdTech and FinTech, etc., where you are developing products and services which are cutting edge for the Indian consumer in the first place and getting funded heavily by the FDI from various types of investors in the US. And this is a huge stability besides the remittances. This is an important component of capital flows into India. So I would say that Structural reforms to promote entrepreneurship, growth, bring in FDI. There are so many sectors in emerging markets that still have very stringent foreign direct investment restrictions because they are so unwilling to give up control, state control or domestic incumbent control of their sectors. And I think FDI relaxations is something in my view that IMF, World Bank should be pushing in a very big way because that's relaxing capital controls in exactly the right direction. You get stable so, long-term flows. Yeah, I think this sounds exactly right. What you said about FDI being the key thing that maybe one should be going after. I mean, of course, a lot of that is endogenous to the institutional space within which these emerging economies are operating, and so as a result, FDI is sometimes a bit harder to generate simply because to be trapped in a place longer requires a greater belief in a stable economic environment, which is not rapacious, which is not exploitative and so on and so forth. So that credibility, I guess, takes a bit longer to build, but that's what you're saying. We should be the focus for emerging economies and on investing. If I could tie the threads a little bit more, Ramati, I would say that in my view, sometimes these kinds of policies get crowded out by short-term palliative measures that central bank is so quickly willing to provide. Oh, government debt is not doing well in the auctions. L yeah, let me cancel the auctions. Let me get public sector banks to buy the bonds. Let me buy your bonds directly through quantitative easing. But if over a longer period of time, you also simultaneously work with the government to say, no, we need to increase the component of our stable flows. Some of that can be done through FDI. There is so much discussion in India about including the government bonds in the benchmark indices. And you know that, that would bring in some passive flows. But I would say, to me, a discussion that needs to be held much more on a fervent and frequent basis is, can we relax FDI restrictions in more and more of our various sectors? I think it's happening. The government is in the right direction on this path. But sometimes I think these policies get sidelined because we are too accommodative and quick to do quick fixes and put band-aids rather than create some structural, stable uh, foreign flows over the long term. So uh, since we've now kind of transited towards India a little bit, let me focus a few more points of this discussion towards India. So one is the natural uh, thing that just relates to what you uh, what we were just talking about, which is this issue of FDI. And we hear a lot about unicorns in India and, you know, uh, this, the, the largest amount of startups and so on. And at the same time, there is a parallel narrative about just the job space being extremely grim, not enough jobs being created. And there seems to be a disconnect between the two. And it has something to do with the fact that the sectors, which you pointed out, tech, ed, fintech, uh, the main areas where this money is flowing are areas which aren't really big job creators. So there is FTI that's going in, but it's not in the sectors which seem to create jobs. And this is in some sense why I was sort of thinking about uh, it is harder to create institutional environments which somehow make you know international investors confident about putting their money in for the long term and things. Somehow, I think these tech intensive sectors seem to have created an international opinion or investment climate where people somehow believe that uh, these things are uh, sustainable, these things aren't going to change. But that doesn't seem to be happening in the, in the non-tech, which is where seemingly yeah. these are the more job-creating uh, sectors. What's the issue here? I mean, yeah, as far as the way yeah, you see it. I, Of course, I think it's kind of very complex, but uh, maybe if I had to pinpoint a few things that I think are bigger factors. One is this whole 
chain of entrepreneurship that I was describing in the tech space, where first we had India providing maintenance of software globally, then staff getting skilled enough to design new service products for the rest of the world, then eventually getting professionalized and skilled enough to actually start providing new products for the domestic economy. It's a very natural way that FDI brings productivity enhancements in sectors. And to me, it's a prime example of how being open in the right way to foreign capital investments, especially of uh, FDI type, where they come and play a strategic role, uh, can actually be in the long run advantage of the economy. I would say, by and large, we have not done this very well in the brick and mortar space of our industries. When we did allow FDI in some sectors, we ran into various political problems. For example, in power and all, we don't allow tariffs to be charged at market rates. How is an equity holder supposed to get returned? Ultimately, assets of this type have to end up in the hands of the government because no one else will invest in a non-market return asset. In some cases, we've had sort of bad taxation policies, retrograde taxation that never gets resolved for a period of time. I think that backfired a fair bit as well. And in some cases, either to protect our incumbents or to send sort of very strongly nationalistic signals for populist reasons, we have not opened up many sectors as a whole. Uh, And so I think Our approach to brick and mortar industries is exactly that. It has been brick and mortar rather than fresh and novel. That's one point. Uh, I think second, I would say that this is not necessarily due to COVID. I really want to stress this point. This lack of flourishing of brick and mortar sectors has been a feature of the Indian economy even pre-COVID. Lack of job creation of a scale that the Indian population and its growth requires has also been a pre-COVID initial condition. Some of this is at least rooted in the fact that our small and medium-sized enterprises have taken a heavy beating over the last 10 years. Uh, Some of it is due to some policy missteps that we made. Some of it is due to their lack of productivity and efficiency compared to our neighbors or our Southeast Asian counterparts. And some of it is because India has so many policies that reward being small, you know, priority lending, tax related things. I think finally, thanks to the pandemic, we are seeing a movement towards formalization. Maybe India's digital finance payment system, et cetera, can make it attractive to small and medium sized enterprises to formalize. And if they formalize, I think they will naturally become big in some way. This is a sector that is important creator of jobs. It has become smaller over time. It requires a very careful thought. I disagree with the central bank policies, which have been to simply backstop the non-performing assets of this sector, just keep postponing the recognition of stress in this sector, almost literally. I think it's done once every year for the last six or seven years. Then it's not a cyclical problem. It's a structural problem. If you have to show forbearance on the same sector five, six, seven years in a row, you are basically in a denial mode. You are preventing the system from accepting that the harsh reality on the ground is that these sectors are truly underperforming relative to the levels of debt that they have and what cash flows they need to generate to repay these debts and what growth they are generating. I think the last point I would make is that my experience in India was, and I have not had the liberty or the ease of studying the data as closely as I was at the central bank, is that in India, when growth picks up, you very quickly hit the ceiling of skilled jobs in terms of slack. In my view, India doesn't have a slack in skilled jobs, even though we have a slack in employment as a whole in the country. And I think this has something to do with the fact that our educational system, the extent of transition we needed from farming to non-farming jobs, our vocational training in preparing people for the kind of jobs that the country is actually creating has not been up to scratch. We are not cognizant in our education, vocational training, and moving away from farming policies of where our true strength in the growth engines lies. Because you can only have it two ways. Either you can choose 
which sectors you want to develop and then go and develop those and create jobs there. Or you have to say, I have some bellwether sectors where growth is high and now I have to train my staff to actually provide more and more labor at low cost so I can remain globally competitive there. And I think right now we are stuck somewhere in the middle. And the reason why I say stuck somewhere in the middle, because my sense is we always do okay. Like India always does okay. It's kind of like never falling off the cliff. And so I, I almost feel everyone can almost say we are better than others or we are better than so many others. And we are always in that space. We are, we are never at the bottom in the emerging markets, if you look at it. And yet, in some ways, we are always short of where we could be. And partly it is seen in the fact that it's so easy to justify an accommodative monetary policy for India, because you can always say we are short of our potential output. And I think that's the gap we need to bridge. Can we go from like being middle tier to really being like a top tier emerging market, like grow at a very fast pace for a while? So, Yeah, well, one of the things that I've heard a lot, yeah, I totally agree, this, this whole thing about not doing too badly and... Uh, yet not being where you should be, is also normalized in India. A lot of Indian intelligentsia loves this phrase, sui generis. So India is always sui generis on everything, that anything you propose, it's like nah, India is sort of special, it's different, it's, it's unique. And so a lot of things. So I think that has somehow also gotten into the collective mindset of uh, policymaking in India. I think that the concern I have with that sort of approach is that it's very often a rationalization approach. It's like a defensive mechanism. It would be nice to say we grew at 8, 9, 10% for three decades and we are unique. That would be a nice <laughs> statement to be able to make. Yeah. But somehow we are not yet there. And of course, every country is special. It has its own circumstances. It had its own core advantages. But my sense is that we are not actually developing our core advantages as well as we could. And that is partly reflecting in the job numbers, which is that we are not shifting labor into where we are growing fast, nor are we then transforming the sectors where labor currently is. And, you know, you can't be in that situation for too long. It will lead to income inequality. It will lead to wealth inequality. It will lead to maybe not reducing poverty at the pace that we want going forward. And it can lead to unrest of various types. Uh, it can so, lead so to discontent. One, uh, yeah. kind of, uh, you know, uh, it seems like one approach that India seems to have taken over the last uh, four or five years mm -hmm. is saying that we are going to try to focus on the domestic market and this Atmanirbhar India, focusing on selling in India. And somehow the idea was that we are unable to compete externally. Our export sector has not really taken off. And so... This issue of creating jobs is an issue of scale. In some sense, our entities, which is this brick and mortar businesses, can they grow to a scale which can employ people productively? And so the market size becomes at least one factor there. India seems to have been moving towards this notion that somehow our domestic market is so big that we don't need the external sector. And therefore, do you see a problem in that kind of thinking? It is definitely one of the largest, by sheer size, the consumer market seen in the kind of investments Google and other companies are making in India. It's like the next bastion of sort of digital expansion. But I think where I disagree with it is that whether that's enough in itself to kind of create the level of jobs that we need. Uh, you know, many who propose a sort of export-friendly policies, they almost always give this examples that no emerging market has really grown sustainably and created jobs of the scale it requires without having decent level of share in the global trade and exports. I agree with that. Where I differ from that is that then they go and conclude that therefore we need a very easy exchange rate policy and stuff like that. In my view, it's not about exchange rate policy. It's really about improving the efficiency and the productivity of our domestic manufacturing industry. It's about real efficiency. It's about producing goods that are of world-class quality. You know, why is it that if the rich were consuming in India in the last 12 and 18 months quite substantially, why is it that a lot of it is just imported goods? And it's okay. I have nothing against global trade. There is core competencies, but it's partly because we don't produce what they need and consume in any decent quality. You know, these things are only produced abroad. 
And I think there's a dangerous path that I worry about, which is that uh, India is actually very heavily deploying tariffs to prevent imports from coming in. And in spite of that, our imports tend to be very, very high. And I think that's a sign that we simply don't produce well what we are trying to keep out of the country from abroad. It's possibly a policy that favors the incumbent, so it gets a lot of acceptance within the country, within industrialists, within those who sort of hobnob and represent the industry with the authorities that be. It's perhaps, as I said, a policy that's easy to market for a nationalist, populist propaganda. And unfortunately, in the current situation, whereas we were discussing that the bottom consumption engine is sputtering because they haven't been big beneficiaries of the post-pandemic policies, I think there is a danger that domestic consumption engine may not even live up to the expectations that we've had from India. I don't think domestic consumption engine looks at the pre-pandemic level yet, and certainly not in a broad-based manner sort of recovering uniformly in different parts. And if we don't do that, how much can the rich keep consuming beyond a point? You know, So I think I'm worried that if we don't open up to trade, if we don't allow FDI in our lagging sectors, if we don't genuinely manage to shift manufacturing that is trying to diversify away from China for a variety of reasons, both geopolitical and supply chain reasons, if we don't manage to transform our manufacturing sector and have it be a big player in global trade, I think we will continue to stay in that middle pack of sort of average performance, not fall off the cliff, but also not achieving our potential. That's the real danger we have. Let me switch to one related issue of Indian development, which is the intermediation sector, which is banks. So Indian banks during your time in India, I'm sure you've grappled with uh, very closely. So there's been an ongoing issue that how efficient are Indian banks? The NPAs have been a recurrent issue for the last 20 years or even more, even longer. We keep it under wraps for a bit and then it explodes and then there is another injection of uh, capital into the system and the party starts again. So I guess I have two kinds of questions on this. One is, is this just a symptom of potential problems with public sector ownership of banks, that somehow there is mispricing that tends to happen more because of public sector ownership? And that could be both due to moral hazard and adverse election issues due to external influence on banking decisions that happen. And secondly, it could also be the fact that banks are saddled with multiple goals beyond just pure maximizing shareholder value. And that is, in in some sense, the origin of public sector banking, that nationalization had this notion that you had to have more goals than just shareholder value. So now, of course, there's the cost to be paid for this. How much of Indian banking metrics like NPAs, et cetera, do you think are due to this public, you know, problems potentially coming due to public sector ownership of banks? And how much is something which is inherently regulatory in nature and so on and so forth that, you know, we don't have enough backstops, we don't have enough oversight of what banks do and which is why these things show up. And what do you see as the way forward for Indian banking? I mean, because people talk of divestment and maybe we have too many public sector banks, maybe we should consolidate. How important is divestment? So just a few thoughts on Indian banking. Yeah, again, you know, the Indian banking is sort of very complex, uh, but I broadly agree with the diagnosis that certainly parts of public sector banks that have underperformed on a repeated basis, and I stress this, which is that there are some parts which are simply not recovering in spite of government capital injections, etc. I think one has to recognize that their banking technology is not working. It's a little bit like Air India, you know, at some point you have to accept that it's not working as a national carrier. It needs to be handed over to professional management that can bring in timely capital, labor practices, efficient management of fleet staff, Maybe it will be less saddled with confusing objectives. Even Air India is often facing confounding objectives because of various reasons. And so the same way, I think we have to accept that certain banks need to be privatized. India has the right disinvestment objectives. It just happens at such a glacial pace 
that we need a new term actually. Even glacial pace is, I think, doesn't describe the pace of our disinvestments in life. It's just extraordinary. It's like we decide that we are going to do this and then it takes four or five years in the system for anything substantial to happen and get over the hump. So I think I have no doubt that we need to do some of that. The good thing that has happened is that over the last 10 years, various governors and parts of RBI have actually helped create a somewhat differentiated banking structure. Maybe it started with Governor Rajan and then others continued that, where you know you have some payments banks, some small finance banks, various kinds of fintech players. Now, even within NBFCs, they are trying to create larger NBFCs whom they will regulate and supervise better than the others. I think by and large, this is a step in the right direction in my view. A little bit like even though we didn't privatize Air India, ultimately other airlines started picking up bigger and bigger share. This is not to say they won't fail. They did fail. In the same way, the non-public sector bank players who enter the intermediation space will also fail. But I think the system should be able to deal with failure. What you want is a system that's well capitalized in anticipation of risks, but that eventually fails. In private system, there will always be some rogue operators and there will be some misgovernance episodes that happen. But you don't want someone to be so large and to impose such a huge burden on the exchequer that it becomes a source of uh, sclerosis over a period of time. They are just guzzling in so much wasteful resource that it's actually taking away money from genuinely deserving expenditures and resulting in capital misallocation at the same time. So my sense is there are so many reports, there are so many proposals. What is a blueprint now is not the question. Question is political willingness. My sense is even the political willingness is there. What I'm not able to understand is what is it in the bureaucratic processes and inefficiency of the system that is preventing from disinvestments to happen at a faster pace. How can you not meet your disinvestment target 10 years in a row? And, 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 and not just this was a, meet them. I mean, on an annual basis, you, you're under 10%, I mean, in terms of the goal yeah, set. Yeah. And, no, and uh, that forces monetization of debts in the end because you're always overspending relative to your revenue collections as a result. And I think if I could end with this one last theme, which I wanted to stress, I want to take a slightly sort of longer macro sweep on India over the last three decades. And it's fair to say over the last three decades, there were the first 15 years and the next 15 years in my view. The first 15 years were, I would call them like truly transformational. I think they were truly opening up India in terms of liberalization, development of markets, improvement of government debt debt management practices, development of the bond markets, I think was like a very, very big step, both for uh, government bonds as well as the state development loans, many of which, you know, the central bank contributed to as well. But In a way, if you then think about the next 15 years, the sort of targets that we set for ourselves, we had the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. It set certain targets for how the government debt should consolidate. Why did that act come about? Because we thought India was ready to embark on that path. We thought India now had a bond market in place. India had growth in place. India had liberalized. It had pro-growth policies. So we thought we were there. Then I would say next, we came up with an inflation targeting framework and we said we'll try to achieve a 4% target inflation uh, in the consumer price index. So we had a debt consolidation path. We had a macroeconomic stability path in terms of inflation growth trade-off. And I think not just the governments and the policymakers, even as society as a whole, we are just perfectly happy that these have been sidelined, that fiscal deficit targets have not been met, Government debts have not been consolidated. We are slipping away from meeting our inflation targets. You know, we are continuing with the framework, but most analysts and observers now talk about the upper end of the band set in the inflation target of 6% rather than the middle target of 4%. This is a very worrisome path in my view. Why is it that after first 15 years of success on the liberalization path, In the next 15 years, we set ourselves very ambitious targets. We thought they were achievable. Therefore, there was consensus on them in the bureaucracy, in the government, 
in the policy space. And yet, we have overall somewhat regressed. Did we liberalize a lot in the last 15 years? I would say no. By and large, the policy has been more of tariff seeking. Did our banking sector improve in the last 15 years? No, actually, the banking sector in many ways regressed in the last 15 years. Did our debt to GDP path improve in the last 15 years? No, we have not been in a path of consolidation. We've been on a path of slippage year after year away from FRBM targets. There was a small phase in which we improved on the inflation front. Maybe we are better off than we were pre-taper tantrum. But again, we seem to be slipping away. We are not taking the mandate on inflation targeting as seriously as we were. And so I'm a bit worried that we set ourselves targets and then we, we are too happy to say that, oh, some uncertainties have come along the way. And I have a diagnosis, I'll just put it on the table, which is that my sense is it's because political expediency of doing short-term fixes to deal with problems is getting the better of all this adherence to the long-term targets. And the political expediency is becoming a trap. It's actually shifting the targets away from what we had in mind. Right now, it's not clear when we can get back to the 2003 FRBM targets. There is no glide path that is clear of when we are going to come back to a 4% CPI inflation target. To me, it's not clear. And I think this ease with which we are deviating from the target, it's a sign of expediency. It's a sign of being happy to do what is required in the short term without anchoring your trajectory and path over the long term to be one of macroeconomic stability. And I'll just put my favorite theme on the table that when political expediency takes hold in India, it generally means fiscal dominance, that governments wanting to spend more, not retrench on their expenditures, not consolidate, uh, that basically starts dominating all policies. And what are the optics of that? What language you use to justify that keeps changing from one scene to the next. But it's the same act playing all over again in every part of the system that I see. Of course, there are things we are doing better. But I think if you look at India over a 30-year period, it's hard for me not to separate the first 15 from the next 15. So hopefully we can turn things around in the next few years. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly hope so. There's so many other issues as well to talk about, but uh, unfortunately, we've kind of run out of time. But I want to end by just thanking you, Viral, uh, for taking so much time to think through and share your thoughts with us. And we've covered a fairly wide map and a lot to think about, but hopefully we'll get another chance to pick up more themes that we were unable to capture. India is such a rich tapestry that you can never quite exhaust uh, all the issues that uh, we wanted to talk about. But thank you again so, so much. It was uh, very helpful, thoughtful, and allowed at least me to think through a few things which uh, were not that clear in my own head. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, No, thanks, Amit. It was lovely to happy, chat. Happy, happy, happy to do it again. In Yeah, no, that'll be great. Thanks. All thanks right. a lot. Thanks. Thanks, Viral. Right.